welcome once again. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivanu L'Asok B'Divrei Torah. Amen. And we're going to go to the share. Okay, and then I have to do something a little different here. Moment, and I should be able to do this. And we are still working on Genesis chapter one, verse one. This is the way it goes. So there's so much Rashi on this very, very significant verse. But we're going to go on a little bit now. And this is the Bara Elohim. And I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite, favorite Rashis. So Bara Elohim. And what jumps out at you is, is this the holiest name that we have for God? And the answer, of course, is no. The ineffable name is the name, the greatest, holiest name that we have for God. Um, but that name, all right, it also connotes mercy. It also connotes, as one meditates on the meaning of that word, essentially has to do with the notion of the transcendent, a transcendent being that, that controls everything, that everything is included in this, if I may speak metaphorically, in the mind of this being. And Elohim has to do with judgment, we know that, but it really has to do with the relationship that God has to creation. It's that's what I've discovered after many, many years. And as I've already mentioned a few times, when we say to God, Eloheinu, when we use that term, we are supposed to be saying, we will accept, we submit to your authority, to your judgment, and specifically to your commandments. And we are going to try to devote ourselves to performing those commandments and living in that way. So, but the point is, so he, it says bara Elohim. It doesn't say bara Adonai. And that's a little bit strange. And this is what he's going to tell us. Rashi's going to tell us. Velo amar bara Adonai. And it didn't say bara Adonai. Adonai created. Why? Shebatchila Allah b'machshava. Because initially it arose in his thought Levar oto bimidat hadin to create the world in the in the mode of the judge of of the quality of justice, and of course, what that would mean is that if you did well, you would be rewarded immediately, and if you did not, you would be punished immediately. That there would be no delay whatsoever in terms of divine justice occurring in this world. And that was God's initial intention, that God had wanted to create the world that way. And of course, we're speaking highly, uh, literally, uh, in, uh, sorry, in a literary kind of way, uh, because this isn't the way, obviously, God really operates. But it's a way to understand something very deep about the nature of reality. Keeping going. And he saw, God saw, that the world, the universe, would not be able to to continue to exist. Oh, sorry. Okay, the dog is in mom's room. If you like. Otherwise, wait. Okay, all right. Thanks. <laughs> all right. The, that the world would no longer be able to endure and consequently, he placed the quality of mercy before it, before the quality of justice. And then he took that quality of mercy and he combined it with the quality of justice. And how do we know this? And this is exactly what is meant when it states in the next chapter, Bayom Asut Hashem Elohim, on the day that the Lord God 
Look at this. Quality of mercy preceding the quality of judgment. Eretz v'shamayim. Earth and heaven. So it's as if God understands that God's hope is that by creating a person, a creature with intelligence, etc., there would be that intelligence to see the amazing nature of creation and to thank its creator, to be in a state of appreciation, of gratitude, of, of joy in create in being created and to want to give back to want to give back but it, it but but god gave human beings absolute freedom when it came to that absolute freedom and because of that it turned out that so many people see that freedom as an opportunity to behave in a different kind of way but god didn't want to see the universe come to an end God wanted this universe to be able to endure. And for that reason, people who are wicked don't necessarily get punished immediately. They don't necessarily see the consequences of their behavior. And I will go further with a beautiful interpretation that I read in Arya Kaplan, because you notice in the Amidah, in that silent Amidah, we don't say Adonai Avraham, Adonai Yitzchak. Adonai Yaakov. We say Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov. We use that word for God. And that is because they lived their lives in that relationship with God that was that of Elohim. They were willing to accept upon themselves divine judgment and a commitment to devote their lives to serving the divine. And that's why we use Elohei. That we don't use the word Adonai with regards to them. So, again, understanding the, the deeper meanings of this word Elohim and what it really refers to. So, that's, that explains, though, why there are people who seem to get away with wicked behavior. But the saddest, saddest part is that it's so temporary. Whatever advantage they have, is so brief, so brief, that if people thought carefully and realized the, the promise of a life devoted, however they want to understand the nature of the divine creator, but that life is to be found in that. And anything short of that, unfortunately, goes away. Now, please understand, you may be aware of it, you may live your life, without an awareness of a divine creator, but you're still living your life in that way, that God takes joy in your behavior, in your words, in the way you treat other people. And um, I see that as a universal principle. I just feel that I was given as a, as a member of the Jewish people, that God gave me an opportunity and to, to express things in the way that we're expressing them going on if any if there are any comments just put your hand up and i'll try and recognize you going on we're still on that first verse oh sorry hold on a second did i finish the rashi on that i'm looking to see yeah yeah i guess i did all right so we we actually got to the end of verse one okay <clears throat> Here we are. Vaharitz Haita Tohu Vavuhu. And the earth at that time, right, was Tohu Vavohu. These are not easy words to translate, um, but Tohu has the idea of desolate, and Vohu has the meaning of void. Rekana, Rekanya, right? Rek means empty. Sadia has to be a word. I don't recognize it as a cognate, but I looked this up in Jastro, and the word is desolate, desolate. Desolate and void, the and darkness over the surface of the deep, the deep waters. The Ruach Elohim. So this V could mean and, or it could mean but, 
right? And the wind, the spirit of Elohim, right? Of Elohim. Merachefet al hamayim. Hover, was hovering over the surface of the water. And I hope you can sense the poetry involved in the writing here, that this image is a poetic image. Tohu vavohu. So Rashi, of course, has to try and explain to us, what are we talking about? What are we describing here? So he says, he takes it in a different direction. And he says, tohu is from Lashon. It has the meaning of tamay, tam, tam, tama, with a hey, which means wonder, amazement. It has to do with how a person would react to something, how we react to something. That something absolutely amazes us. Amazes us. The shimamun means um, desolation. Desolation. So, Tama, Tame, astonishment, amazement, wonder, Shimamun is desolation. Sha'adam Tohe, because a person would be confounded. There's that root again, Tohe, Taha. U Mishtomeim, right? He's uh, he's amazed, I'm sorry, U Mishtomeim, and he's confounded Al Bohu Shaba on this chaotic condition in which the universe existed before the process started that that um, that Bereshit describes. So it doesn't, I'm not saying that there's no uh, creation out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo, but that because the whole term of bara does have that that meaning of to be able to create something out of something out of nothing. But the way it's being described here and the way Rashi's talking here is that we are talking about sort of this um what can i say unformed mass this just glob of matter and we're not trying to describe it from the absolute very beginning so again tohu he gets into this word again and he uses a french word uh and it looks like a tournison something like that and it means dizzying dizzying the loss Bohu, the word lashon rekut, it has the, the connotation of emptiness, desolation. With, sorry, sedu is desolation. Alpne okay. to him over the surface of the deep, alpne hamayim she'al ha'aretz. Remember, at this particular point in creation, there's nothing but water surrounding the earth and, this, and the way this is being described. Baruch Elohim Merachefet, and a spirit, or but a spirit of Elohim hovers. And this is how he describes it. Kisei HaKavod, the divine throne. Right, so what does a throne represent? Why? What is the symbolism of a throne? Well, any chair gives you opportunity to sit down, to be comfortable, to have a sense of presence, and I think the idea of a throne has to do with how well-founded a, 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 a monarchy is, that it represents that he is, he's not going to be toppled over, he isn't going to have to escape, he is accepted, and, and even if not maybe accepted, but that his, his or her kingdom monarchy stays firm. So there's an idea of that this isn't just a temporary kind of thing, that there's a sense of the permanence of the divine presence. Omed Bavir, it stands up, stands in the air, right? It's suspended in the air. The divine throne is what this is translated. Umarachef, and it hovers, doesn't touch, it hovers up Nehamayim over the surface of the water. By the breath of the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be He, over Ma'amaro and His statement, His words. Kayona, like a dove, Amarachefet al Hakain, that is hovering over the nest. And then, of course, we've got the French word, Akuvte, or something like that, 
the Lars in French. So again, I, as I said, this is a, a very poetic image of the divine presence and the fact that it's mirachef, that it's not uh, touching, but that it's hovering, I think it, it describes, at least as I understand it, the presence of God everywhere, but not in a way that it's necessarily touching, that it's so obvious that we have to become aware of it uh, in our own kind of way. And, and I think this has also to do with the idea that, you know, some of you are familiar with this mystic concept of tsim which means contraction. And it has the idea that if the world was totally filled with the divine presence in it, in a, in a complete kind of way, there wouldn't be room for anything else. And so that God had to contract God's presence in some way so that there'd be room for freedom, for human beings, for life to exist. And I think it's a very important principle, likewise, in terms of leadership, that when you're a leader, you don't do everything. You have to allow some space, some breathing room, uh, and uh, you have to do some symptom as a leader for the people that you're trying to lead. Uh, at any rate, I think this is just this beautiful way of trying to put down some foundational ideas as to the divine presence and how the divine presence operates. And again, knowing full well that there's no way we can adequately or properly or perfectly describe what we're talking about. By Yomir Elohim, and here it is. Yes, David. So this brings up, at this point, though, uh, the world is still completely filled with water, right? I mean, you, you were yeah. mentioning that there, there's no right. land masses at this point. Is, is that uh, correct? Correct. They are buried. They, they will, what's going to happen is they're there, but they're not, they're, they're all submerged. Right. So my question there is why, maybe this is orthogonal, but why did we have to create land masses? There is no, I mean, why did God create land masses? Because God could have created, you know, human beings. I mean, obviously there are creatures that live in the water, right? And it could have been that human beings, you know, could have, you know, been sea dwelling rather than, you know, right. land dwelling. We so, could have created with gills, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of possibilities. Yeah. So is it because that contraction is what allows this, this Love space it. where God doesn't exist and therefore and that's where people have the space to be, you know, exist without or not without God, but with, the, you know, as you've just pointed out, without that, that divine presence so that, you know, they have the opportunity to, you know, I, I guess, learn and grow. Or is there another reason that that, you know, yes. anyway, that's my question. Very good. So I think you're right on the money. I think you're on the right idea. Uh, I think it does have to do with that. I think it goes beyond that, too. I think water essentially is also, remember that comment that Rashi made about the fact that it says bara Elohim and the idea of strict justice. Mm -hmm. Water is a symbol of divine justice and judgment uh, because it says in the second paragraph of the Shema, if we don't follow God's commandments, God will hold, withhold the water. So we know the fundamental role that water plays in human existence and in, in sustaining human life. Uh, but it's, it's, it's also associated with the quality of judgment. So allowing the, allowing the earth to then, in other words, separating the waters from the earth allows human beings to also have a physical presence in the world. In other words, you know, water basically takes the shape of its container, whereas physical matter that is although i know water is physical but it's a liquid but solids have a different kind of quality and i think that uh, that having that solid solidness allows human beings to make an essential choice between physicality and spirituality and materialism and being spiritual and and again the reason for this has, is deeply buried in the very purpose of existence to begin with. That if we did not have these choices, if we were not given 
freedom to make these choices, there'd be no merit to our lives, no purpose to our lives whatsoever, if this all happened automatically. So that in all, in so many ways, uh, the genesis here is sort of foreshadowing the very nature of human beings and and the and the reason that and the purpose for which we are created. And the the the, the good thing about being physical is that it's a lot easier to manipulate material things than it is to manipulate spiritual things. Spiritual things tend to have a certain permanence uh, that material things don't have. And so consequently, but making us material, putting us into a material world, if you'll excuse the reference, <laughs> um, is, is, is an opportunity. It's all part of God's kindness to us and, and, and an expression of divine love for every individual to be able to do tshuva, be able to discover how powerful tshuva is and... Um, be able to, you know, find purpose in life. And because there's something great when you are able to discover kindness and, and holiness and spiritual values, but they're not obvious. And, and again, this idea of God not being in our face, although there are times when <laughs> I feel God is in my face, and telling me not to do something and tell and protecting me. And of course, you know, I'm the child who feels the parents just trying to control them and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I would agree that I think you're, you're on the right track. And, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Sure. So let's keep going. Uh, so God said, let there be light. By he or, and there was light. So, um, Vayar Elohim, this, I believe there's nothing here on Rashi. The question, of course, that everyone asks is what are we talking about? Because we know that the sun and the moon and the stars were created on the fourth day. And yet here we're talking about light. And in preparing this class today, it occurred to me what we might be talking about. And again, we want to try and 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 tease out every bit of symbolism like with water with darkness with light that there's symbolic and metaphoric meanings to these words which the torah is trying to share with us in this abbreviated kind of way so by our elohim god saw this is a form of the word ra'a to see god saw Et haor kitov. He saw how good the light was. And I have to thank my professor, Hanan Brichto, for that translation. Because he took objection to translating, God saw the light, that it was good. He said, that's not English, nor is it even a good translation of the Hebrew. But he saw how good, how tov, exactly what the word tov means, right? How tov the light was. And now comes an essential part of creation. And that is, God introduces now a binariness to the world. And I have to say that if we aren't, don't understand how fundamental and essential binary, the binary system is, uh, not just in arithmetic or mathematics, but in making, being able to see make distinctions, and yet be loving, and perhaps be extra loving because of those things. And to respect, and to be able to respect um, differences. By Yavdel Elohim, God um, divided Bein Ha'or between the light Uvein Ha'choshech, and between the darkness. So here we have, we have, we, we are monotheists, we believe in one source, of all existence, but we also believe that creation and life is binary. And when we don't, aren't able to work that through, the world actually returns to tohu babohu. It goes back to that. 
So let's, while we have a little bit more time, let's just go into this. I'm going to look at the Rashi. Vayar Elohim et or kitov vayavdeo. God saw how good the light was, and he divided. Af Rashi says, this too, this too. Anu srichim ledivre agada. We need to be able to interpret this in an agadic kind of way, meaning in a highly metaphoric kind of way. Ra'ahu, that is, he saw, he saw this light, that wicked, wicked people were not worthy of being able to use this. And all of a sudden it occurred to me, and we'll go on and you'll see why I'm thinking this way, that this light is, in fact, eternal life, eternal existence. That's this ore of the first day. We're talking about immortality. Uh, and that's why wicked people are not worthy of living forever unless they do tshuva. But for a wicked someone who engages in wickedness, thank God they don't live forever. Their lives will come to an end. And God saw this. God saw that not everything could continue to exist. And we know, right? You look at plants and how plants require light to be able to exist. And perhaps by observing that, they could understand how vital it is to have light and to be able to take it a step further and to use light as a metaphor for immortality. Anyway, let's keep going. And so he separated it out for the righteous, for the future world. And atid lavo is another term for life after death, right? For where we are in the future. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to place the arrow here. And so next Sunday, God willing, we'll continue with this um, and discuss it further. So I'll stop the share and thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning.